The John F. Kennedy International Airport outside New York City is one of the busiest airports in the world. In 1999, nearly 32 million passengers fly in and out. More than 340,000 flights take off and land. Egypt Air Flight 990 is destined to be one of the most controversial ever to leave this airport. The fate of this flight challenges the strength of an international friendship between two allies and uncovers a hidden mechanical flaw in one of the world's most popular airliners. The FBI will become involved. We reviewed surveillance tapes to, in, to, to indicate whether or not anything unusual was loaded on that plane. Investigators in two countries developed two different theories. Was this a tragic accident or a terrible crime? Just after 1 a.m. on October the 31st, 1999, the 217 people on board Egypt Air Flight 990 are waiting for takeoff. The flight's command captain is Captain Ahmed Al Habashi. He's been with Egypt Air for 36 years. The command first officer is 36-year-old Adel Anwar. He switched duty with another co-pilot so he could return home in time for his wedding. Soon be a married man. Congratulations, Adel. Thank you very much. The airline's chief pilot for the Boeing 767, Captain Hatem Rushdie, joins them in the cockpit. At 20 past one in the morning, First Officer Adel Anwar is going through his takeoff clearance with air traffic control. You fly the gateway climb, climbing to 5,000. Following gateway, clear for takeoff, runway 22 right, Egypt Air 990 heavy. Cabin crew advised. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Cabin crew, take off position. After an everyday blessing, the co-pilot assists the takeoff. For safety, both pilots push the throttles. On a flight of 10 hours, it's standard practice at Egypt Air to provide a relief crew to share the flying duties. The command crew takes off and lands. The relief crew flies the middle portion. Tonight, Captain Rauf Nur al din and First Officer Gamil El Batuti are the relief crew. They will take over after the first three or four hours and fly the plane until shortly before Cairo. V1, rotate. Positive rate of climb, both sides. 1,000. Egypt Air 990, heavy contact. Departure now, 125.7. 1257. Bye. A large number of passengers are senior citizens from the United States looking forward to touring the wonders of ancient Egypt. Uh, my dad and Ginny were married in 1998 on October 23rd. And to celebrate their first anniversary, they decided to take a trip to Egypt. Anita Child's parents are retired and on their way to Egypt as well. They always had great time on these tours. They traveled frequently and so it was a pleasure trip they were looking forward to seeing the holy land especially Maureen Sacratini and her brother John Simmermeyer enjoyed the fact that their parents loved to travel they had been particularly fond of a program known as elder hostel and this particular vacation trip uh, to visit the pyramids and the other um, uh, historical uh, sites in Egypt was an elder hostel trip. There are 14 of Egypt Air's experienced crew operating the flight. There are also 33 Egyptian military officers and pilots on board, returning after training with the American Armed Forces. Gamil El Batuti used to be an Egyptian Air Force flight instructor. He's now one of the oldest first officers at Egypt Air. He's so much older than the other co-pilots that out of respect, they call him Captain. But some at Egypt Air think that Captain El Batuti has been coasting too long on the favors of old friends. Just over 20 minutes after takeoff, El Batuti is about to leave his seat. Former National Transportation Safety Board investigator Greg Phillips became an expert on the events of this flight. The relief first officer who would have been expected to come to the cockpit 
somewhere during the later part of the flight, uh, halfway or wherever he was comfortable, or wherever the normal change would have been, came into the cockpit about 20 minutes after takeoff. Hello, Jimmy. How are you? How do you, sir? What's new? I, uh, I slept, I swear. Just wait. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to sleep at all. I might come sit for two hours but and then... I, I, I slept. I, I slept. You mean you're not going to get up? You will get up. Go and take some rest and come back. You should have told me this. You should have told me this, Captain Gamal. You should have said, Adele... Did I even see you? I will work first. Just leave me a message. The younger first officer seems surprised that El Batuti wants to replace him so early in the flight. And I'm not sleepy. So you take your time sleeping, and, uh, and when you wake up, whenever you wake up, you come back, Captain, OK? I'll come either way. Captain. Come and work the last few hours, and that's all? It's not like that. That's not the point. Look, if you want to sit here, there's no problem. I'll come back to you. I'll go get something to eat and come back, all F right? Fine, fine. Look here. Why don't you go? Why don't they bring your dinner to you here, and then I'll go sleep, OK? That's good. OK, with your permission, Captain. And with that, El Batuti leaves to get his meal. Do you see how he does whatever he pleases? Do you know why that is? Captain El Habashi senses his first officer's resentment and tries to smooth over the situation. Are you a youngster? Anwar wonders if El Batuti wants to take over because he may not want to work with relief captain Nur El Din. Doesn't he want to work with Rauf, or what? It's possible, it's possible, God knows. But look, you shouldn't get upset, right? By this prophet, he's just talking nonsense. That's it. Everything's under control. OK, Chief. Thanks a day. First Officer Anwar concedes and is ready to hand over to El Batuti. <clears throat> Normally, this is the most relaxed, easy part of a long flight for pilots and passengers alike. The highly automated aircraft systems will take care of the flying for several hours. It's very unusual for an airplane flying over the Atlantic at nighttime to encounter any kind of difficulties. We normally uh, expect accidents to happen in approach or landing or near airports, and very seldom do we get anything out over the ocean in the middle of the night. Excuse me, Jimmy, while I take the trip to the toilet. Go ahead, please. Before it gets crowded. Well, they're still eating. I'll be back to you. Before the captain returns, disaster will strike Egypt Air Flight 990. The fate of everyone on board will be in the hands of the co-pilot, the man who shouldn't be here in the first place. Boeing 767 bound for Cairo, Egypt Air's Flight 990 appears to be cruising smoothly over the Atlantic. The relief first officer Gamil El Batuti is alone in the cockpit while the captain has gone to the washroom. But then the plane dips, plunging down. The nose pitches down, creating zero G, weightlessness, throughout the aircraft. This airplane basically started at 1G, which is what we'd expect for level cruise flight, as you push the nose down, as if you would be cresting the top of a hill in a car at a high speed that drops away. You'd feel the, the airplane fall away from you, and you would start to feel a little light in the seat, and as the dive progressed, you would, you would feel a little bit lighter yet. I didn't lie on God. Whatever the first officer is intending, he says nothing except this phrase again and again. Captain El Habashi fights the disorientation of zero gravity, desperately trying to return to the cockpit. An American journalist living in France studied this flight extensively. 16 seconds after the dive began, when the airplane had gone into zero G and into negative G and was at an extreme angle, the captain somehow made his way back into the cockpit. How he did that physically, I will never know. Warning signals indicate the dive is exceeding the maximum speed allowed for the plane, taking them to 99% of the speed of sound.
This far past the plane's design limits, the stresses on the airframe are pulling it apart. What's happening? <laughs> Captain El Habashi pulls back hard on his control column. Then he tries to use the engines to power their way out of the dive by pushing forward on the throttles, but he gets nothing. Who shut off the engines? Oh God. Desperate, the captain deploys the speed brakes, panels standing up from the wings in an effort to slow the dive. is slowing back from the brink of the sound barrier. The dive goes on, but the nose is coming up. In just seconds, they go from zero G to double the force of gravity. Captain El Habashi struggles to level the plane and pulls back hard on the control column. The 767's dive begins to slow. Hold me. Shut off the engine, boy. In seconds, the engines stop and the power goes off, plunging the aircraft into darkness. Here, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder stop. No one knows what happened in the plane during the next two minutes, but radar tracks its path. The plane is climbing again. Up from about 5,000 meters to over 7,500 meters, as the aircraft's structure is weakened by the stresses of abnormal speeds and maneuvers. Then the aircraft falls into another terrifying dive. Stressed beyond endurance, the left engine is ripped from the plane. At 1.52 a.m., Flight 990 disappears from radar screens, crashing into the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, some 100 kilometers off the American coast. Coast Guard search and rescue get a call at 2.15 a.m. A plane has disappeared, and Coast Guard vessels are called to the scene. The U.S. Merchant Marine training vessel King's Pointer is first to arrive. Just as, uh, as the day was dawning, uh, we noticed oil in the water. And that was the first indication, so we turned the ship around uh, back into the oil, and about as soon as we turned around, we started seeing debris rise up to the surface. In Heliopolis, a Cairo suburb, Captain Al Habashi's daughter can only guess what her father went through. Can you imagine if you have a beloved one, a father, a daughter, or a brother, facing all the horrors of finding himself falling from 30 6,000 feet suddenly trying to uh, save his life, his colleagues' lives, the people, the passengers. In a home in Maryland, a sleepy Sunday morning takes a tragic turn. I had woken up for some reason at 5.30 in the morning and we were flipping on the TV to check the weather to, and we were deciding what mass we were going to be going to. It was Sunday. Um, and Immediately on CNN, they had Flight 990 missing, and I was in total shock. I ran down to my refrigerator where I had my parents' itinerary, and I ripped it off and just started sobbing uncontrollably. I was screaming. I didn't know what to do. We located a significant debris field, and that we have concentrated our search efforts since then on about a 36 square mile of area, about 50 miles south of Nantucket. At the end of October, the waters of the North Atlantic are so cold that normal life expectancy is about five to six hours. In Cairo, relief captain Rauf Nur el-Din's daughter May clung to hope for her father. I was talking to myself, trying to convince myself that my father was not on this plane. And if uh, he's on this plane, he will be safe because uh, my father was um, an Air Force pilot, he had a very good experience. And uh, I thought maybe if the plane crashed, he will be able to, you know, to, uh, to be uh, in a safe place and to swim and to go to any, uh, 
Lamb. At the crash site, all that's left is pieces. Within hours, authorities know there's little hope for survivors. We believe it at this point that it is in everyone's best interest to no longer expect that we will find survivors in this case. Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak reaches out to a stricken nation. This is the worst air crash in Egypt's history. I was shot. It's a big tragedy for us. And uh, I give my condolences to all the passengers, to the families, to the families of the crews who have been lost in this tragedy. And I have contact with President Clinton and other embassies. And he's uh, giving good support for uh, trying to find, investigate, see what was the reason. The American president would answer his ally with a commitment. And I spoke earlier with President Mubarak of Egypt today to express my condolences and assure him that we would be working together closely until this matter is resolved. We do not know what caused this tragedy. In northern Indiana, music historian Jim Brokaw learned what happened to his father and stepmother. One of the many things that I felt on that first horrible morning was the sense that people all over the world were confronting the same horrible circumstances that I was and had the same sense of helplessness and disorientation that I did. Shocked and grieving, relatives arrive at Newport, Rhode Island. They will seek answers and share comfort. There were 100 Americans, 89 Egyptians, 21 Canadians, and seven victims of other nationalities on board. They're all asking, what caused this tragedy? Teams of investigators will pursue that question for years to come. We are beginning what may be a long investigation, and we are prepared to do what it takes to find the answers to the questions we are seeking. In Washington, Greg Phillips from the National Transportation Safety Board leads the investigation into this crash. From the very beginning, we realized it was a very difficult case. The airplane was in cruise nighttime out over the ocean, and uh, when it went into the ocean, there was just a little bit of floating debris, but we had to recover the airplane from the bottom of the ocean to begin the investigation. The job of finding the black boxes would be difficult. The water is about 70 meters deep, and the tremendous force of the crash has smashed the locator beacons off the boxes. In this case, both the, uh, the underwater locators, called, which are called pingers, uh, which help us locate the boxes underwater, were detached. Uh, so we, were, we had an extra difficult job in trying to find the actual boxes where the recording material was contained. Nine days after the crash, the U.S. Navy's unmanned submarine Deep Drone recovers the first of the two black boxes, the flight data recorder, which stores information about what the aircraft and its systems were doing. Four days later, the second black box, the cockpit voice recorder, lands on the deck and is carefully transported to the NTSB laboratories. The cockpit voice recorder captures all sounds in the cockpit for the last 30 minutes of the flight. The black boxes are protected to withstand impacts of 3,400 times the force of gravity. The recovery of the cockpit voice recorder provided a gripping and bewildering picture of the last minutes of a disaster. Here, investigators hope, is the key to unlock the mystery of Flight 990. Translating the Arabic spoken in the cockpit is a top priority at NTSB headquarters. The cockpit voice recorder was good quality. Uh, it was easily usable and translatable by the investigation team. Well, the cockpit voice recorder is always just a piece of the investigation that fits many other pieces of the puzzle. It goes along with flight data, recorded data, uh, examination of the wreckage, and all the other aspects of the investigation. On major investigations like the crash of Egypt Air 990, the NTSB works routinely with the FBI. The physical evidence has to be managed in case it's needed in court. 
Former FBI Assistant Director Lou Shaliro is a veteran investigator and no stranger to air crashes. By the time Egypt Air occurred, we were fairly adept at looking at airline disasters, uh, particularly with the uh, view of developing whether or not a terrorist incident or a criminal act had occurred. The FBI checked for evidence of bombs, terrorists, or terrorist targets on the flight. Trying to determine luggage uh, against the passenger list and whether or not there was anything unusual in, in the manifest, whether or not the people that loaded the plane could recall anything that would have caused them concern. Uh, we reviewed surveillance tapes to, in, to, to indicate whether or not anything unusual was loaded on that plane. We had no evidence at all of any explosive device on board Egypt Air that night. At the NTSB, American investigators found no fault in the aircraft from studying the flight data recorder. But Egypt's members of the investigation team insisted that not all the evidence was in. Much of the wreckage was still in storage on Rhode Island. They hope the cause of the crash can be found here. Egypt's representatives search for any possible mechanical cause for the crash. While they search, other theories are pursued. A study into the causes of airline crashes published in January 2001 points to pilot error as the cause of one third of these accidents. It also finds a strong connection between bad weather and pilot error. But the crash of Egypt Air 990 occurred in clear weather with veteran pilots. What happened in the cockpit would divide the investigation and fuel an international controversy. I've got 